Australian Aborigines today live their unspoiled tribal life only in the most remote areas of Australia. However, small semi-nomadic bands of Aborigines did live in all parts of the continent for thousands of years. Within their tribal area, they were constantly on the move in search of water and food. They hunted almost all native animals, but an important source of food was the kangaroo. So were lizards, of which this goanna is the largest. The women collected the smaller animals and a variety of plant foods like fruits, nuts, yams and seeds, wherever they could find them. The few billabongs and creeks yielded the roots of sedges and water lilies and the fruit of the nardu. In times of drought, the Aborigines were forced to live near permanent water, their only buffer between life and death. In better seasons, they moved on once again. Campsites like this one were occupied by Aborigines until a hundred years ago in western New South Wales. Near their fireplaces or cooking ovens, they left stone implements too heavy to carry. Like this grindstone. Often nearby, the native artists hammered pictures into the rock, illustrating their daily life, food and folklore. Emus were a popular subject for these rock engravings. And their footprints are well depicted. The ability to recognize animal tracks was most important to the Aborigines in their constant search for game. The tracks on the right are those of kangaroos. The group of small depressions represent emu eggs. Human figures are shown in various ways. In the rocky hills near waterholes, the caves provided excellent shelters in the hot summers and cold winters and during rainy weather. The walls provided ample surfaces for the artists to decorate. In these caves, the paintings form a vivid record of many of the phases of the life of the people. Some are isolated figures. Others form a series or frieze of related paintings. But there are many figures which cannot be identified among these paintings. The Australian Museum in Sydney sent an archaeological field party to Western New South Wales to make a permanent record of cave paintings there, to study their history and meaning, and to discover how long this art had been practiced. A preliminary examination is made to determine the extent of this particular series and where it would be best to begin recording them. Many of the paintings are well preserved because of the low rainfall and dry atmosphere. Others are being destroyed by water seeping through the rocks in rainy weather and some have been washed out in this way. These paintings will be carefully copied by the museum party to preserve a permanent record of the art. The museum therefore designed special equipment which could be easily and quickly assembled to make this task of recording not only easier but more accurate on the irregular rock surfaces. Strips of plywood are joined together to form a flexible frame. 
Different sized frames are used according to the area of paintings to be recorded. A grid of six inches square is used. Brackets are then clipped to the frame to which adjustable legs are also attached. The flexible grid is then carefully positioned over the paintings. Having set up the grid, the artist can then copy the paintings using a scale of one inch to the foot. The scale can be varied as required. This is a unique pattern of human figures, standing on one another's shoulders in three tiers and joined at the hands and feet. Photographs are taken of important figures and groupings and to record the various colors employed. These will complement the artist's scale drawings of the paintings. The archaeologist demonstrates how the Aborigines used a twig brush. These varied in width from a quarter of an inch to an inch or more wide. The end was teased out by chewing. Stenciling, like this axe, is one of the oldest forms of art known to man. Stenciled hands are common. They were made by spraying a mouthful of pigment around the object. Another method of painting was by using one finger, although this method is comparatively rare. The Aboriginal artist uses four main colours. A white pipe clay dug from the ground is very common. The yellows and the reds were obtained from natural ochres and oxides, usually in hard rocky lumps. In this area, black charcoal figures are uncommon. Frequently, two or three layers of figures were painted over one another by succeeding generations of artists, and careful observation is required to separate them. In some cases, it is also difficult to make out an individual painting or to relate sets of figures to one another. The museum artists used coloured pencils to indicate the various colours employed by the Aborigines. Constant checking and rechecking is necessary to make sure the copy is accurate. From these copies and the photographs, the archaeologist will later analyze the cave paintings to discover their meaning and to interpret their significance. Frequent discussion between artist and archaeologist is necessary to interpret indistinct figures. The activities of the men are most frequently illustrated. They were the warriors who protected their groups. They preserved the tribal religion and mythology. They were the hunters who supplied meat for the camp. Kangaroos were an important source of food, but they were not always easy to kill, so the hunters employed magic to ensure success before they set out. Here the medicine man, wearing the head and skin of a kangaroo, performs a rite of hunting magic over a kangaroo at his feet. Thus fortified, the hunters set out after the game, which, because of the magic, became easier to kill. Although the spear was the chief weapon of these tribes, the hunters are more often shown armed with shield and boomerang. Here, a hunter appears to be delivering the death blow. Other animals are shown among these cave paintings, but those hunted for food, like the lizards, are best represented. Emus were also an important source of food. The adult birds are a frequent subject among these paintings, although the eggs and young are not shown. 
Emus were hunted by parties of both men and women. Sometimes the animals were chased into large nets, which this design may represent. After a successful hunt, these Aborigines held corroborees in which the men depicted folklore stories, the killing of emus and kangaroos, and other incidents of daily life. Their music was provided by beating two short sticks together to mark the time for the dancers. At sacred ceremonies, the men painted their bodies and wore headdresses. Only initiated men joined in these ceremonies. Battles were recorded by the cave artists. Group combats were caused by sorcery, trespass and for killing or injuring a member of a neighbouring group. Duels were fought between men or between women who had a private quarrel to settle. Designs like this one on the right are sacred maps of the journeys made by the great spirits who created the countryside and the people. These maps also show important localities mentioned in the myths. Emu footprints, hunters, kangaroos, ceremonial designs. These tell the archaeologist many things about the people but there is no way of finding out from the paintings how long ago the Aborigines lived here. To find the answer, excavations have to be made in the cave floor, which has been built up century by century since man first lived in the cave. This midden is carefully sieved, layer by layer, for the remains of bones and shells of animals and stone, bone or wooden implements discarded or lost by inhabitants in past times. This is a grinding stone used by the women when making flour. The material obtained reveals the kinds of food and implements used and the prehistoric period or culture to which the implements belong. Pieces of pigment are especially valuable in helping determine the age of individual paintings. To find the antiquity of this culture, a small quantity of charcoal, the remains of a campfire, is taken from the lowest level of the deposit. It is not touched with the hands to avoid contaminating the carbon, which will be later dated by the radiocarbon method. The stone adzes and other implements excavated here belong to a culture that has been in use for several thousand years. In this part of New South Wales, the scattered evidence still remaining helps the archaeologist to reconstruct the life of the Aborigines in prehistoric times. The story told in the rock engravings and cave paintings illustrate hunting and the weapons and magic associated with it. The animals killed for food, corroborees, ceremonies and sacred designs. The museum's work will provide a permanent research record and contribute towards our knowledge and understanding of Australian Aborigines. Their art, realistic or abstract, naturalistic or formal, shows a distinctive mode of self-expression and it is important that these last remaining evidences of an Australian Stone Age culture should be preserved before the ravages of man and time finally destroy them.